Um, great, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here to speak today. So this is the book, um, The Simpsons and Their Mathematical Secrets. I've been working on this book. Um, I first started writing to the writers about eight or nine years ago. And uh, for the last eight or nine years, I've been thinking about this book and talking about this book. And whenever I talk about The Simpsons and I say to people, there's tons of maths hidden in The Simpsons, um, people are always shocked and surprised. Um, and, 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 and what I'm trying to do in this book is I'm trying to explain to people that there are lots of writers on The Simpsons who love mathematics. There are lots of writers on The Simpsons who studied mathematics to degree level, to master's level, to PhD level. Um, now, they're no longer mathematicians. They're now writers. But they still love mathematics. And the way they express that love is by putting little bits of mathematics into the series, um, often when we're not looking. What sort of thing am I talking about? Well, um, for example, here's an episode called Marge and Homer Turn a Couple Play. Story here is that... Um, Buck Home Run Mitchell is married to Tabitha Vicks. And Tabitha Vicks and Buck um, have a, a, a marital spat. Uh, their marriage is in trouble. They go and talk to Homer and Marge, and Homer and Marge repair their marriage. And by the end of the episode, everything's all right. But the very finale of the episode, um, Tabitha you know, proclaims her love to Buck. But at the end of the episode, at the same time, on the Jumbo Vision screen at Springfield Stadium, what you see is this question up on the Jumbo Vision screen. And it asks the crowd, what's the attendance at the game? Is it 8191? Is it 8128? Is it 8208? Or is there no way to tell? OK? And nobody ever noticed this, because everybody's paying attention to, to Tabitha. Nobody ever noticed these numbers. But each one of these numbers is there for a very special reason. It's there because each one of those numbers is mathematically significant. So for example, if you take the first number, 8191, um, 8191 is a prime number. Some of you may have spotted that. But it's not just any old prime number. It's a Mersenne prime number. So Mersenne prime numbers have this very special form there of the form 2 to the power p minus 1, where p is also a prime number. So in this case, if you raise it uh, to the power 13, 2 to the power 13 minus 1, you get 8,191. So somebody put in that 8,191 because, OK, it's a plausible number for a baseball crowd, but it's also a Mersenne number. Um, and Mersenne primes are very special. Uh, I think t the 10 biggest prime numbers we know of are all Mersenne primes. So somebody put some thought into that. And the next number is the same. The next number is 8128. 8128 is a very special number. It's what's known as a perfect number. And a perfect number is one of those numbers where the divisors of the number add up to the number itself. Um, so the simplest example is 6. 1, 2, and 3 divide into 6. And 1 plus 2 plus 3 equals 6. Next perfect number is 28, because 1, 2, 4, 7, and 14 divide into 28. And they add up to 28. Um, you might think they're fi fairly common. 6 and 28, so you know, we're, we're already getting a couple of perfect numbers. But the third perfect number is 496, and the fourth perfect number is 8128. And they get fewer and further between. Um, I think Rene Descartes said that perfect numbers, like perfect men, are very rare. Um, <laughs> and they're rare, and they're special, and they get to be on the scoreboard. Third number, th this is a number I hadn't really heard of, a type of number I hadn't heard of before I, I started writing this book. 8208. What's special about 8208 um, is that it's got four digits. And so what you do is you raise each digit to the fourth power. Four digits, so you raise each digit to the fourth power. 8 to the power 4 plus 2 to the power 4 plus 0 to the power plus 8 to the power 4. Sorry, let me say that again. 8 to the power 4 plus 2 to the power 4 plus 0 to the power 4 plus 8 to the power 4. Add that all together and you get back to 8208. So the number regenerates itself from its own components. Um, it's kind of in love with itself. And so it's called a narcissistic number. Um, and again, these numbers are very rare. There's less than 100 of them that we know of. And the biggest one is that. I think it's about 39 digits long. Um, and you might want to have a think this afternoon, because I know the kind of people you are, um, why you cannot have a narcissistic number with more than 39 digits, OK? They're rare, they're special, there's less of 100, 100 of them. They get to have a special place up on the scoreboard. So this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Really kind of niche mathematical knowledge embedded within an episode for no particular reason. Um, I had to mention this one. Um, the cinema, uh, the, the movie theatre in Springfield, is called the Springfield Googleplex Theatre. Um, and 
I guess this is part of your history um, here, at, here at Google, so um, I'll tell it to you anyway. Um, the, the Google, of course, again, you have to remember, the first time the Googleplex appeared in The Simpsons was back in the early 1990s, so before the company Google existed. So nowadays, people may have an idea about what a Google is mathematically and what a Googleplex is mathematically. But when this first appeared on The Simpsons, nobody had heard of a Google. Nobody had heard of a Googleplex. And so it was a really in joke for the mathematicians who were watching. And of course, a Google, um, the name Google was invented by uh, a mathematician and his nephew. Uh, the mathematician was uh, Edward Kasner. And he was going for a walk with his nephew. And uh, he said, oh, you know, a million's got six noughts. A billion's got nine noughts. A trillion's got 12 noughts. What do we call a number with 100 noughts? And his nephew said, why don't we call it a Google? And that's where the name Google came from. A Google is a number, one followed by 100 noughts. And then the uncle said, OK, well, a Google sounds like a good number. What about a Googleplex? What would a Googleplex be? And the nephew thought about that. And he said, OK, that's easy. A Googleplex is one followed by so many zeros that your arm gets tired. Um, <laughs> Now, that's not very mathematically reliable. So the uncle uh, said, OK, well, if a Google is uh, 10 to the power of 100, a Googleplex is 10 to the power of Google. So again, this is a really mathematical in-joke in The Simpsons. Now, who's putting these jokes in there? Who's, who's making these references? Well, that particular reference uh, was probably made by this chap here. Um, on the back row, second from the left, is a chap called Mike Rees. Um, I say probably Mike because the writing process on The Simpsons is very collaborative. And uh, we're going back kind of 20 years now. And so it's hard to remember who said what. And uh, people are very generous in terms of sharing credit. But it was probably Mike Reese in this case. Um, I, I met The Simpsons writers last year. And I chatted to all of them. And uh, I met Mike. And, and, and uh, Mike, Mike, Mike's interest in maths goes back a long, long way. Um, when he was in a, a high school uh, math team, he was very good. He was very strong. He competed against other schools, competed at state level. He was a very bright, a very strong mathematician. Uh, but he was also a very keen writer, he loved comedy, loved comedy writing. So even when he was younger than that, when he was, I think, 11 or 12, he told me he went to the dentist one day and he was waiting in the waiting room and he was reading through New York magazine. So not the New Yorker, but New York magazine. And he was looking at the back page where they had the cartoon caption competition. And he was looking at the cartoon caption competition. The dentist came out and said, oh, look, Mike, uh, I see you're looking at the cartoon caption competition. Um, I enter that competition every month. I always manage to think of something every month. And Mike said, yes, yeah, so do I. Uh, I've won it three times. <laughs> And he was competing against TV comedy writers in New York and winning this competition. So, so he had this talent for comedy writing and mathematics. Um, somebody else who was in the room, in fact, the, the, the chap who told me that it was probably Mike who came up with that joke, was um, Al Jean. Al Jean, again, this is another high school photo of him in the athletics team. Uh, there he is in the back row in the middle. Um, Al Jean, another very bright young mathematician. Um, in fact, he was so bright that he was taken out of, um, well, he, he was put into a special program for elite mathematicians. This was going back to the, I guess, the mid 70s. And the idea was America wanted to compete with the Russian elite mathematical uh, education system. And so people like Al Jean were hot housed in special uh, summer courses. And he was such a bright young mathematician that he went off to Harvard to study mathematics um, when he was just 16 years old. Um, so these were really bright people. Al uh, and Mike uh, met at Harvard. They left Harvard. They went into comedy writing. They joined The Simpsons. They worked on that very first episode uh, of The Simpsons. And even in that very first episode, you get mathematics. You get mathematical references. Um, but the interesting thing is that even when, a, if, you look at a, if you're looking at The Simpsons, and if you look at it now, and you spot a mathematical reference now, you know, you'll be more eagle-eyed and, and more keen to find these things. But if you find a mathematical reference, it could be that the writer of that episode is not necessarily an ex-mathematician. Um, let me explain to you how that happens. Um, this is an episode called Marge in Chains. Uh, you may remember this one. Marge is accused of theft from the Quickie Mart, and she's put on trial. And the, um, the star witness is Apu. And Lionel Hutz, the attorney, is trying to discredit Apu and saying to him, you know, you've got a terrible memory. You know, why should we trust your evidence? Why should we tr trust your, your witness testimony? You've got a terrible memory. 
And Apu responds by saying, no, no, I've got a great memory. In fact, my memory is so good, uh, in fact, I can recite pi to 40,000 decimal places, and the last digit is one. OK? So he could have said anything. He could have said, I can remember the Springfield telephone directory. But he says pi. And he talks about reciting the digits of pi. Now, there are a couple of interesting things behind the scenes of this one simple line that I want to explain to you. Um, first of all, why 40,000 digits? Why was Apu claiming 40,000 digits? Well, that was the world record in 1993 for memorizing pi. So it was a genuine world record, and Apu claimed to be able to match it. Sure enough, the 40,000th digit is one. OK? <laughs> can't get that wrong. Um, in fact, you can't get it wrong if the writing team consults a world pi expert. Uh, they contacted a guy called David Bailey at NASA at the time. And David Bailey was a world authority on pi. And he had he'd, um, he'd developed something called the Spigot algorithm. You know, when I was at school, I was always taught that if you want to calculate the fifth digit of pi, you need to calculate the first, second, third, and fourth digits. If you want to calculate the hundredth digit of pi, you've got to calculate every single digit before it. The great thing with the Spigot algorithm is that it's like a tap. Uh, Spigot is a tap, and, and it drips. And it will drip whichever decimal place you want. So if you want the millionth decimal place of pi, you just adjust the tap, and the millionth decimal place drips out. And that's what David Bailey invented. And he could have just dripped the 40,000th decimal place, except the Spigot algorithm only works in hexadecimal, <laughs> which is not very friendly uh, for, for a TV audience. So, um, so instead of dripping the 40,000th digit in hexadecimal, um, he sent them all 40,000 digits in a big package, and uh, they could go and figure it out for themselves. Um, but the other thing I wanted to explain about this line is that this is one of those episodes that wasn't written by a mathematician. Um, it was actually written by a couple of people. It was written by uh, uh, Josh Weinstein and Bill Oakley. And both of them are not, neither of them are mathematicians. So the question is, why are non-mathematicians putting math into their episodes as well? And the way this happened was I, I met Josh last year, and, um, and he said that that wasn't his line. He and Bill didn't come up with that line. What had happened was that they were given that episode to write. They went away for a couple of weeks. Um, and they wrote the broad structure of the story, the key plot points. They put in the key jokes. And then they bring it back to the rest of the writing team. And the rest of the writing team will maybe identify the weaker jokes and take them out, maybe help make some of the good jokes even better. Um, and it's at that stage that around the table, there will almost certainly be one or two mathematicians. And that's the stage at which you can introduce mathematics into a script that otherwise was devoid of mathematics. So in this case, uh, the original script said, um, so, so Josh dug this up from his garage, the original script, uh, Lionel Hutt says uh, to Apu, uh, so Mr. Nahasapima Petalan, if that is your real name, have you ever forgotten anything? And Apu says, no, in India, I was known as Mr. Memory. I featured in over 400 films, including Mr. Here comes Mr. Memory. So nothing to do with Pi. But you can imagine, you know, around that table, the mathematicians would have said, you know, here's an opportunity to get some maths in, uh, some mathematics. Um, but it's also an opportunity to kind of build up Apu's backstory. Because you may or may not be aware that Apu is also a mathematician. Um, if you piece together different elements from different episodes, you get his backstory. And Apu uh, studied at Caltech. Uh, he went to Caltech, uh, not the California Institute of Technology, but the Calcutta Institute of Technology. Um, <laughs> And then, after graduating, he came to America and he studied for a PhD in computer science with Professor Frink. And um, he, he studied at the Springfield Heights Institute for Technology, which has a rather unfortunate <laughs> acronym, as you've, as you've already spotted. So you get the mathematics in here because it fits in with Apu's background and you can have a bit of fun with Pi. It's easy to think that the math in The Simpsons is going to be linked to Lisa. It's going to be linked to Professor Frink. It's going to be linked to Apu, the, the kind of more mathematically minded characters. But you find that Homer and all the other characters often exhibit or, or get involved with mathematical references. Um, so for example, this is an episode called The Wizard of Evergreen Terrace, um, where Homer tries to become an inventor. And uh, in one scene, again, it's kind of a freeze frame gag. You've got to really look carefully, because in one scene, there's a blackboard. And on the blackboard, you have 
Um, that's a reference to the mass of the universe. It's a science equation. That's an equation that relates to the mass of the Higgs boson, mass H0. Um, and if you work that out, you find out that, that that predicts a mass, I think, of about double the actual mass of the Higgs boson. But that's not bad. This was happening 15 years before the Higgs was even discovered. Um, in terms of mathematics, you get like a topology reference down here about uh, the, the reshaping of donuts into spheres. Um, <laughs> but the, you have to nibble at them rather than twist them. Um, but the one that really caught my eye, and this is the episode I think that really got me interested in, in all of this mathematics in The Simpsons, this equation here, uh, a number to the 12th power plus another number to the 12th power equals another number to the 12th power. Um, now that caught my eye because um, the first book that, that, that I wrote uh, in the UK, it was called Fermat's Last Theorem. In, in, in the US, it was called Fermat's Enigma. And it's all about this chap here, Pierre de Fermat, who's a French mathematician. Very, very quickly, I'll tell you the story. Um, he was studying an ancient Greek text one day, the Arithmetica by Diophantus. And Arith the, the Diophantus talked about the fact that there are lots of, lots of solutions to Pythagorean, the Pythagorean equation, x squared plus y squared equals z squared. Um, 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. 5 squared plus 12 squared equals 13 squared. There are lots of solutions to that equation. There are an infinite number of solutions, in fact. But Fermat wondered what happens if you increase the power to something bigger than 2. So for example, um, x to the power 3 plus y to the power 3 equals z to the power 3, or any power bigger than 2. Can you find any solutions to any of those equations? Now, Pierre de Fermat claimed that he could prove without a shadow of a doubt that there were no solutions. He wrote in the margin of his book, I have a truly marvellous proof of this fact. I have a demonstrationem mirabilum. But this, this margin is too narrow to contain that proof. Hank marginis exiguatus non caparate. And then he dropped dead. Um, or a few years later, he dropped dead. People found the book. They said, well, Fermat says he can prove these equations have no solutions. But he doesn't tell us what that proof is. And for 350 years, everybody tries to rediscover the proof. Eventually, a chap called Sir Andrew Wiles rediscovers the proof. And we now know for a fact that none of these equations have any solutions. So you will never find a 12th power plus a 12th power equaling a 12th power. And yet, that's what Homer gives us here. <laughs> and if you check that, if you've got a phone, you check it on your phone calculator, that works. So Fermat is, uh, Homer is defying Andrew Wiles. He's defying Pierre de Fermat because he has found a solution that seems to work. Now, why does it seem to work? Um, well, if you calculate it uh, more accurately, um, it's what's called a near-miss solution because the actual solution is the following. It's uh, not 44.72, but 44.72.0000000. So it's called a near-miss solution. It's a solution that will fool you. It's a solution that will fool your calculators. But if you've got a precise calculator, one with a proper long display, you can find out that it's a near-miss error. So again, this is a lovely example of, of one of the writers, in this case, uh, David X. Cohen, um, going to the trouble of putting something in the back of shot, a little gag, a little reference that lovers of mathematics will spot, will be annoyed by, and then will resolve. Um, so it's just a prank. It's just, it's just a prank for those who love mathematics. Um, and there's tons. I, I could I just think how we're doing for time here. Um, for, I, I mean, there is tons more. There's another reference of, of Fermat's uh, last theorem in Treehouse of Horror 6. Treehouse of Horror 6 also has references to Cartesian coordinates, has references to P versus NP. Uh, that great unsolved problem. It has references to Euler's equation again. It has references to the Utah teapot. It has stuff in ASCII. Uh, there is so much in The Simpsons um, that you could write a whole book about it, in fact. Um, um, so uh, so uh, rather than go on about The Simpsons further, I did want to talk about uh, Futurama. Uh, because Futurama is the sister series of The Simpsons. And um, it has just as much mathematics as The Simpsons. Um, I mean, the, the story here is that in the mid-90s, Fox could see that The Simpsons was a huge success, and they asked Matt Groening to come up with something else. He came up with Futurama. Um, he worked with David X. Cohen, 
uh, to to develop the idea, and, and David is is kind of one of the guiding uh, uh, guiding lights of the series. He's worked on it ever since, and um, and and he's a mathematician. He's a mathematician at heart. I think he studied physics uh, at Harvard, then did computer science, a master's in computer science at Berkeley, and has then written math mathematical papers. Um, and, and he loves mathematics. He's put mathematics into The Simpsons, and he's going to put mathematics into Futurama as well. And he was also keen to recruit mathematicians to join the Futurama writing team. It was quite important not to poach writers from The Simpsons. So new writers came on board, people like uh, Ken Keeler, who has a PhD in applied mathematics, uh, people like Jeff Westbrook, who was a professor at Yale University. So you had new mathematicians coming to join Futurama working with David X. Cohen to create a series which was also going to have tons of mathematics in it. Um, this is a picture of, of Ken Keeler. Um, it's not the greatest picture of Ken Keeler, um, but it's of great historical importance because um, this, is, this relates to an episode called The Prisoner of Bender, where uh, Professor Farnsworth invents a mind-switching machine, and everybody starts switching minds left, right, and center. Um, and at the end of the episode, everybody gets bored and wants to get back to their original minds. But the mind-switching machine, once two people have swapped, they cannot swap back. So the question is, <laughs> the question is this, given any number of people, given any amount of, of mind-switching, is there a way to guarantee that everybody can get back to their original minds? And Ken Keeler um, developed a little theorem uh, he's very modest about it. He, he uh, doesn't think it's a great piece of mathematics, but it's, it's an interesting and fun piece of mathematics. And this is him scribbling it up on the whiteboard in the Futurama offices, which is why it's of great historical significance. But he was able to prove that regardless of the size of the switching, regardless of the number of switching, if you introduce two fresh bodies into the room, they provide you with enough wriggle room for everybody else to get back to their switches, uh, back to their minds, uh, back to their bodies. Um, <laughs> So, and, and I just wanted to mention this because this is the only example in the history of television of a writer creating a bespoke theorem <laughs> in order to complete a plot. So that's the extent of the kind of stuff that goes on in Futurama. Um, I'll just give you one example from Futurama, um, which is the number 1729. Um, 1729 crops up in Futurama. It crops up as the uh, hull registry number of the Nimbus spaceship. It crops up also um, as Bender's unit number, Bender the alcoholic robot. Um, uh, it crops up in the Farnsworth Parabox, is one of the universes uh, that, that's featured. So 1729 keeps cropping up. If it was just the whole registry number, OK, we could ignore it. But the fact it keeps cropping up means that it must have some mathematical significance given the fact we have Ken Keeler and David X. Cohen and Jeff Westbrook working on this team. Um, and one, one reason why 1729 is special is that it's called a Hashard number. Um, and Hashard numbers have this odd property. Um, if you take the digits of 1729 and add them up, they come to 19. And 19 divides into 1729. And that's all it has to be to be a Hashard number. What's particularly special about 1729 is if you reverse 19, you get the other factor of 1729. So, yeah. <laughs> that always gets an ooh, that does. That always gets an ooh. Um, uh, so it's a very special type of Hashard number. But in fact, there are four numbers that exhibit this property. Um, so it's special, but not special enough to justify being cited so many times in Futurama. And the reason. Uh, the real reason why 1729 keeps cropping up um, is because of this gentleman here. Um, this is uh, Srivinasa Ramanujan, um, arguably the most talented or naturally gifted mathematician of the 20th century. Um, he grew up in southern India, was from a very poor family. I think his three siblings all died in infancy. He suffered from smallpox but survived. Um, his family just about managed to give him a basic education. Uh, he couldn't get to university, couldn't get to college. But still, he would study mathematics by going to the library. And he'd pick out books uh, and, and study the mathematics within them. And pretty soon, he wasn't just studying the mathematics in these books. He was creating new mathematics, new theorems. 
And eventually, he had a whole package of these about 120 theorems that he'd created. And nobody could understand what he was doing. And so he sent them to a professor, uh, a G.H. Hardy, in Cambridge, England. And they arrived on Hardy's desk. And, um, and Hardy was blown away. He couldn't believe what had appeared out of nowhere from an unknown mathematician on the other side of the planet. And his immediate reaction was to invite Ramanujan to come to Cambridge. And, and G.H. Hardy was a formidable mathematician. He's credited with galvanizing English mathematics at a time when English mathematics was in the doldrums compared to France and Germany. So he really was spearhe spearheading British mathematics. And yet he said, if there's only one great thing I've done in my life, it was to bring Ramanujan over to England. Because when he came to Cambridge, he flourished. Um, his, his genius uh, was, was, was recognized. He became a fellow of the Royal Society, one of the youngest fellows of the Royal Society. He became the first Indian to become a, a fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge. Um, and, and, and his mathematical potential was being fulfilled. Sadly, however, physically, he was really suffering. Um, the cold weather really, really hurt him. He was a strict vegetarian. He was a strict uh, Hindu, so the diet uh, didn't really suit him either. He came down with tuberculosis eventually, um, and he went back to India uh, and, and died in his 30s, um, tragically young. But just before he went back to India, when, when he was ill, he was in a nursing home in Putney in South London, and Hardy went to visit him. And Hardy took a train from Cambridge to London, took a taxi from the station to the nursing home, went into the hospital, sat next to uh, Ramanujan, and um, struggling to make conversation, perhaps, uh, Ramanujan said, um, you know, what was the name of the taxi you came in? And Hardy said, oh, it wasn't very interesting. It was just uh, 1729. And Ramanujan said, 1729? No, that is a really interesting number. It's an interesting number because 1729 is the smallest number that's the sum of two cubes in two different ways. Now, let, let me just unpack that. Um, 1729 is 10 cubed plus 9 cubed. Now, most numbers aren't the sum of two cubes, so that's interesting. 1729 is also the sum of 12 cubed plus 1 cubed. Very few numbers are the sum of two cubes in two different ways. And this is the smallest number that is the sum of two cubes in two different ways. And Ramanujan just knew that. He just plucked that from thin air. He had a natural um, understanding of numbers. He, he used to say that at night, uh, while he was asleep, one of the Hindu goddesses would write mathematical truths on his tongue that would somehow become absorbed into his brain. And he could just pluck these things from thin air. And because it was one of the last conversations uh, that Ramanujan had before he left to go back to India and before he died, that conversation has gone down in history. And 1729 um, has gone down in kind of mathematical folklore. And that's why it keeps on appearing in Futurama. It's Ken Keeler's way of just acknowledging this, this great genius, Ramanujan. Um, and it's just, it's kind of wonderful, I think, that, that Ramanujan, um, some hundred years after he started corresponding with, with Hardy, is remembered in this way, in this sci-fi um, animated sitcom called Futurama. And it doesn't just stop there, because um, you can then ask, OK, that's the, um, that's, that number's the smallest number that's the sum of two cubes in two different ways. You can then ask, well, what number is the smallest one that's the sum of two cubes in three different ways? Um, and you end up with an eight-digit number, something extraordinary, something like 83 million or something. Um, but that number also appears in Futurama. <laughs> Um, it's called a taxicab number of order three, and it appears <laughs> as a taxicab number in Future Armor. So I'm going to stop there, but we do have uh, 10 minutes or, or a bit more even if people have questions. Um, I've, I've skipped over a lot of things and um, may not have explained things in complete detail. So if people have questions, um, I think we have two microphones. Very happy to try and answer as many as I can. That's what, yeah. Hey, uh, awesome seeing you here. It's actually really awesome because I, I saw you on YouTube before on Numberphile. Oh, great. Talking about Fermat theorem. So the uh, question was, this is really cool stuff. And can we look forward to, to, to seeing more of this kind of in a more popular medium than closed room? Oh, well, yeah. Um, uh, I hope so. I hope, um, I mean, the, the great thing, uh, the book's been published in the UK for about two weeks now. And in the UK, um, 
the, the mainstream press have picked up on it. Um, radio shows have picked up on it. The tabloid press have picked up on it. Uh, there's something in the Huffington Post today. There's some, so, so what's really nice is, okay, this is a big, thick book, and not many people may buy the book, and not many people may come to talks like this. Um, but I think it'll get disseminated um, through all these other m media. And, and I think the writers are really happy. I mean, I call, I call the book The Simpsons and Their Mathematical Secrets. Um, but it's never been a secret. The writers have never tried to hide this. Um, they've just put it in places where people might not necessarily look. Um, and, and I think they're really pleased that, that people are now noticing this. Um, I think one of the reasons they do this is because they think of themselves when they were teenagers and um, how they loved mathematics. And maybe there were, it was hard for them to find ways to um, see other people loving mathematics. And yet, if you're a, you know, a teenager now and you see The Simpsons and you notice that there's a narcissistic number on there, and you think, well, hang on, the people writing this much love, lo must love mathematics as much as I do, and maybe it will make them feel better about their, their love of mathematics. Thank you. Well, thanks. Uh, I, I had a two-part question. Uh, the first part is, um, you know, I assume that Matt Groening probably has a lot of support for these kind of jokes, and he, he gives them a lot of encouragement. And then the second part is, why don't other TV shows, you know, try and do the same thing? Yeah. Seeing how popular The Simpsons is. Yes. No, you're right. I mean, I, I get the impression that Matt Groening, from the very start, gave writers the freedom to, to express their particular interests. So, again, from that very, very first episode, well, I call it the first episode, Bart the Genius. Um, Bart's having lunch, and one of the fellow students opens a lunchbox, and it's there for a split second. But if you look carefully, it's an Anatoly Karpov lunchbox. Okay, Anatoly Karpov was world chess champion in the early 70s. Uh, not many people would necessarily know that. Um, he was also a mathematician. Uh, not many people would know that. Um, he also is responsible for auctioning the most valuable stamp from the Belgian Congo. Um, not many people know that either. Um, so, um, so that kind of niche, not, as I think, and the, but the fundamental rule was these references must not get in the way of the jokes and they must not get in the way of the plot. And so, um, so with the Googleplex joke uh, reference, um, as I'm fairly sure Mike Reese came up with that, um, somebody around the writing table said, yeah, who's, who's going to get that? Nobody's heard of what a Googleplex is. And I, I think Mike Reese responded, well, yeah, maybe not many people will get it, but how funny can you make the name of a cinema? Um, so um, you haven't lost anything, and maybe you've gained something. And then uh, why, the, why The Simpsons and why Futurama? Um, Al Jean, uh, I, asked, I have a chapter in the book about why mathematicians are involved in comedy, and there are lots of them, you know, not just within The Simpsons, but um, we have people in the UK, people like Dave Gorman, people like Dara O'Brien, uh, Tom Lehrer, and the finest musical satirist of the 20th century. Um, so mathematicians, uh, there is a link between mathematics and comedy, and I, I talk about that in the book. Uh, but then I, 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 I think I asked Al Jean, um, but why have you all congregated here? And um, there are a couple of reasons for that, but I think the most interesting one was that he said that, Al Jean said that when you do mathematics, and he made a distinction between mathematics and science and everything else, um, and may, maybe with computer science as well. The mathematics and computer science, when, whatever you write down happens. Whatever line of logic you write down, the next line of logic flows. You are in complete control of what you are doing as a mathematician um, and as a computer scientist. You, you are in control. Um, whereas science is messy and equipment breaks and the weather gets in the way and you, know, you don't have enough statistics, so maths is pure and perfect. Science is impure and imperfect. Animation is pure and perfect. What you write in your script will be read. What you draw on your storyboard will appear on screen. Whereas with live action comedy, again, you're dealing with the weather, you're dealing with directors, you're dealing with actors, and so on. So he drew the parallel. Well, he, he, I think his line was he said that animation is a mathematician's medium. So maybe that explains why. why. Sorry to break the format. This is not a question, but just an observation. I wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you for your work with the uh, protecting the, the right of authors and, and individuals to 
present their opinions, the Defamation Act this year, and of course the BCA lawsuit. So thank right. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's, it's um, just a bit of background in case people don't know. <laughs> but um, I mean, people like to think of England um, as, a, as a kind of land of, of, of justice and fairness and free speech. Um, but we still actually have, as of today, really quite harsh libel laws. Uh, people from all over the world would come to London to sue for libel. Uh, it was a libel capital of the world. You'd end up with Danish newspapers being sued by Icelandic banks, <laughs> Ukrainian oligarchs suing Ukrainian newspapers, all in London. A ridiculous. Saudi billionaires sued a uh, New York author in London. Um, and it got so bad that um, your president actually brought in a law that said, if you're an American, you get sued in London, your assets are safe because we have so little respect for English law in terms of libel. Um, and that was really important because it actually helped us begin to change our laws. I got sued for libel, as did a few other people who were science writers, health writers. Um, and, and, and people just thought it was ridiculous that you, you can't write about science without being sued for libel. It was ridiculous. You know, in science, the way we move forward in science and many other areas is through robust argument and debate. Um, but anyway, it took a few years, but eventually we now have a new Defamation Act, Defamation Act 2013, which is much more reasonable. Um, and that will become law literally in the next week or two. Um, and, th and what was really great about that was it was very much a grassroots campaign because bloggers were getting th sued for libel, get threatened with libel. Um, local newspapers, uh, online news groups. So we have a, an organisation in Britain called Mumsnet, where parents share their, their experiences. They were getting threatened with libel. It was ridiculous. Um, the only problem left, um, once this law becomes law in the next week or two, um, is Northern Ireland. Um, because Northern Ireland is, um, still isn't updating its laws yet. And that could become the new libel capital uh, of the world. So um, you might find yourself being dragged to Belfast if um, you say something which somebody doesn't like. But thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, that guy kind of stole my thunder a little oh. bit, but uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I've I've read all your books. I read the code book twice. It's a great book. Um, but I think the most important book you've written, in my humble opinion, is uh, Trick or Treatment. Uh, if I was king of the world, I'd make everyone read it. Um, uh, and I'm curious to know, are you still active in the science-based medicine community? Do you do anything or are any plans to update that book? Yes, yeah, th no, thank you very much for your kind words. And um, the, um, so trick or treatment, so the, the point of that book, so I write, I'm, I'm, my background is in physics. That, that's what I studied, that's what I love. Math is kind of the same kind of thing, so I love math, I love writing about that. Um, but I ended up writing this book about alternative medicine um, because a couple of reasons. One was I'd heard about students going on their gap years. Before going to college, they travel around the world and they would use homeopathy to protect themselves against malaria. And I couldn't believe this was true, so I asked the young student to go to 10 homeopaths, and she said, you know, I don't like using conventional treatment. Can you give me something to, that I can use instead? And 10 out of 10 homeopaths said, here, use these sugar pills. And her story was she was going to go to West Africa uh, for 10 weeks on a truck tour uh, where there are strains of malaria that will kill you within three days. And there are examples of people that use uh, homeopathy and he came back to Europe and suffered multiple organ failure because of severe malaria. So um, I was shocked that you know, fairly bright young people um, were being taken in by homeopathy. So um, I sat down with a professor of complementary medicine, in fact, um, but a very rigorous uh, scientist, very much what we call evidence-based ma medicine is, 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 what, what he, um, is, is, is what he follows. Um, and, and so he's been examining alternative medicine for the last 10 years. And the alternative therapists hate him because sometimes he finds something that works. And he'll say that because that's, he's a good scientist. But often he'll find things that don't work, which aren't backed by evidence, and which might even be dangerous. So the alternative therapists hate him because they say, you know, you're the first, he was the world's first professor of complementary medicine. And they say, you know, if you're the professor of complementary medicine, you should be championing complementary medicine. And he says, well, look, you know, if I was a professor of toxicology, I wouldn't be championing toxins. It's not, it's not how it works. Um, so he and I wrote down, we, sat, we wrote down, we, we, we wrote a book, and, um, and then, uh, which looked at all the different alternative therapies, and one or two of them work, and we say that, uh, most of them don't, some of them are particularly dangerous. 
Um, it was after writing that book that I wrote something in a newspaper that that's why I got sued for libel. Um, and I still, I still occasionally write about alternative medicine and, um, and support one or two groups that are involved in challenging alternative medicine. Um, so it's, uh, I mean, for example, right now we've got a horrendous magazine in Britain um, called What Doctors Don't Tell You. And you can buy it in your supermarket, you can buy it at your, your, you know, the, 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 the newspaper outlets. And it, it essentially says that doctors have got secrets that they're not telling you, and, um, and we're going to tell you the real truth. And, and, what, and, and, and it's just full of claptrap and dangerous claptrap, and people believe what's in it. Um, so we're currently um, talking to people to say, and, 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 I'm pr very pro free speech. So if supermarkets want to stock it and sell it, I can't stop them. Um, and I shouldn't be able to ban them from doing it. But I want these supermarkets to know what they are selling so that they're aware that if they generally have a policy of promoting good health and um, supporting their customers and giving them proper information, then do they really want to be stocking this magazine? That's their choice. Um, um, but it's one that I would caution them against. So I'm still involved with, with those kind of campaigns and those kind of issues. Um, so, um, so yes. Um, thank you very, very much for listening. If people do have more questions, I am going to be here for five or ten minutes, so please do come and say hello, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.